And then I also, another favorite thing of mine is that I can generalize the lax modality to be NRA, where N can be either static or dynamically determined. I only considered the static case yesterday. Uh, and, and, that's a, and then that gives you parallel bonds. So here we get what I call bind otherwise, just to remind you that there was some otherwise clause. And here I call this par bind to remind you that it's the source of parallelism. It's a fork join model of parallelism. So when you start peeling off things like this, you realize that you know there's something. This is evidence that there's something right about what you're doing. Like that, certain things, uh, uh, certain things uh, make, uh, start to make sense. Okay, so I must have erased that by accident. So that was supposed to say state. Okay, so that's what we did uh, last time, and I want to finish some of that discussion because I mentioned at the very end, and I had hoped to get to it last time, but I couldn't. Which is the idea of recursive types, which were originally put forward and studied by Dana Scott and a remarkable innovation. His original motivation was to give a kind of mathematical understanding of the, the so-called untyped lambda calculus, at which he successfully did. And, the, and he made the point, which I'll come back to later, that what is commonly called the untyped lambda calculus should really be called the unitype lambda calculus. And that has some implications. And I'll ask you to bear in mind my desideratum about the strictures that are what matter, not the affordances. So I'll get back to that in a minute. Okay, so Dan introduced this, and one of the one of the one of the really important things he did there that had a lot of longevity is using topological methods to do the study. And let's not worry about this. But Dana invented in, in that context the idea of you, you could say approximating the idea of computability through topological considerations. And it was a very, very nice idea. So he introduced a certain notion of continuous function, now called Scott continuous function. And, and, uh, and he used those things uh, to give a model lambda calculus. I'll say something about that uh, a little bit later. So the core of it though is, is, although he was looking at, what he was looking at is one particular recursive type, but the idea is that I wanna look at recursive types in general. And the idea is I can write down, I need a notation for it. So I can have a, a type expression with a free type variable, which is designated as my parameter, sort of like a polynomial or a multinomial. And you, you know that it's, Thought, to be thought of as a function of x or a function of y. So I can designate that here. And I say, well, I want that recursive type and it's going to be isomorphic to its unfolding. What is its unfolding? You, the T stands for the type itself. So it's a kind of self-reference, but it's at the type level. And maybe surprisingly, maybe unsurprisingly, I will be able to derive self-reference in the sense that we defined earlier via self-reference at the level of types. So that's what I'm going to do here. So it's really recursive types of the subject. So what's neat about this, it just as an aside, when I introduce PCF, there's this ad hoc thing of just throwing in fix. Okay, and there's this ad hoc thing about the evaluation order. Well, we resolve the ad hocness of the evaluation order using types. But what about the damn fix? Where did that come from? Shouldn't it emerge as uh, out of type structure? Yes, it should. And indeed it does. It emerges out of the structure of recursive types. That's why I'm interested in this. Okay, so it's beautiful because Types tell you what to do, okay? A programming language is the sum of its types. And anyone will tell you otherwise, I will claim they're wrong. And uh, I'll remark on that uh, in a minute, okay? But in the course of my lifetime, academic lifetime, my career, uh, this has gone from being a deviant marginal outside interest of some weirdos to like the bread and butter of the subject and what else would you do? So uh, I, I've had the, the privilege to live in that period of time. Uh, so it's been uh, quite a fascinating enterprise uh, for me. Okay, so the idea is that when I say they're isomorphic, it means I have maps back and forth, which in a sense, I'm not gonna develop here, have to be mutually inverse, and I'm not, I'm not gonna go into the semantics enough to develop what I mean by equality. So let's not worry about that. But at the minimum, uh, that's why I put it in scare quotes, isomorphic. So they, at a minimum, I have maps back and forth. So if you give me something of the unfolded type, I can fold it back, that's the way one pronounces these things. I can fold it back to get an element of the recursive type. And if you give me an element of the recursive type, I can unfold it to get an element of the unfolded type. So you'll notice the unfold and fold operations are happening. They're a runtime notion, and they, but they are uh, influenced by the type structure. That is whether you have a, it's the intro and a limb form for the this notion of recursive type that Dana invented. Okay, so uh, so what I so what I want to do is I want to point out that. Uh, this idea of folding and unfolding, as soon as you introduce this, it doesn't actually make sense 
uh, if I start proceeding naively, like this is, yeah, the, maybe this is a good point for me to make uh, at this moment. Let me make a little scratch page for myself. So the thing I want you to notice is that, well, it starts to come very close to the idea that, and then we can push this further, but there's this general idea that it's tempting to think of types in terms of sets, the stuff you learn about in school. And if you speak loosely enough, I suppose it's all right. But if you start being you know, careful about it, then it's not all right, okay? In fact, one of the lessons about, about all of this that we're discussing about type theory is it emerges from constructive mathematics, which was hitherto a, you know, absurdly deviant philosophical weirdos who were advocating some random crap that has nothing to do with math. And it went from that to being like at the very heart of the subject and uh, a, a very nice thing that happened both scientifically and socially about a dozen years ago was a famous mathematician, the late Vladimir Vavatsky got interested in type theory and that suddenly made the whole subject legitimate. So it was extremely uh, helpful for people like me. So it was, uh, I was really delighted, delighted to see that. And the idea is you base everything on computation. So, okay, so the idea is I don't wanna think about types as being sets. And the, the thing you want to be, you know, you wanna be careful about is I'm saying, if I write, if I say that, uh, you know, rec t, you know, t dot t, think of that as solving the equation t equals tau for t, because the idea is there's a t in here. Well, if you try to interpret that in terms of sets, you're gonna immediately run into a problem because it's gonna be like Cantor's theorem will apply because you can say to me, oh, okay, so then I can talk about the set T, which is isomorphic to its own power set, can't I? And well, you can't do that. Cantor told us that, okay, a long time ago, you can't have a set X, which is isomorphic to two to the X, okay? So something going on here, we're not talking about sets, you see? So Dana's idea of using continuity was to cut down the function space to be merely, so to say, the continuous functions and not all possible functions. It's roughly analogous to a certain class of subsets, not all possible subsets. And then type theory, you don't take power set as a primitive notion, but anyway, let's not worry about that. Okay, so I just wanna point out that certain naive intuitions start to fall apart very quickly. And it's part of the reason for the interest in constructive mathematics and type theory is it's, uh, it's all grounded in computation. That's the beautiful idea. Brouwer's beautiful idea is that a proof is a program and we can uh, develop math on the basis of the notion of algorithm, which is shared, a uh, concept that is shared by all human beings. I mean, I just love this perspective because it says, you know, math above all is an activity conducted by humans to explain the world. And the way we do this is that we understand the notion of an algorithm because that's the foundation for language, how we even can talk to each other in the first place. And we just exploit that to talk to each other about math. Oh, isn't it gorgeous? It's the gorgeous, it's the most beautiful idea I've ever heard of. Okay, it's completely fantastic, but you don't have to agree with me, but that's why I got interested in the subject. Okay, so so we're, we're, there are other phenomena which I won't discuss with, uh, show you that your types are not going to be set. So my point is this, is that in addition to what's happening here is this is T arrow two, where it is, that could be thought of as Booleans. And the idea is if it's total, then you're completely screwed. But if I'm allowed to have partial functions, then I can have solutions. They might be trivial, but you'll at least have solutions. This is the, the core idea. Then one has to explain what is meant by partiality. That's where the notion of the Scott topology comes in and that's where Scott open sets and Scott continuous functions come in. But let's, I'll just use those words and then move on. Okay, so the, this was all by way of saying, that's why I'm using this partial error here. So what I want you to understand is what's kind of cool is that by using recursive types, I can explain self-reference. And the idea is that I can introduce a type called tau self, which is a self-referential uh, a value, a self-referential value of type tau. So what does it mean to be a self-referential value of type tau? It means that the thing takes an, you could say an implicit argument, which is given to it because it's a function. And it, what is given to it as an implicit argument is the thing itself. That is, whenever I go to access a self-referential thing, I quickly tell it what it is because it otherwise doesn't know what it itself is, okay? So this is the idea of self-application, which will come up in a little while as one of the niftiest hacking ideas around. And if you're not familiar with it, I hope you will experience the same delight I had about it when I first learned about this. 
So the critical idea is you can introduce this recursive type that is written here, where T is just an auxiliary. It doesn't occur in tau. So it could be a self-referential mat if I like. And you say, wait a minute, what do you mean by a self-referential natural number? Well, well, that's a really good question. But suppose we arrange things so that we have a lazy successor and really we're dealing with suspended computation, then I can speak of the fixed point or a self-referential natural number by a fixed point of the successor, the infinite stack of successors. Okay, so it can make sense. It just depends on what you're doing. And the partial function space is, is, is what ties you into the computations. I mentioned that last time. Okay, but more uh, something more uh, more more familiar to all of you is self-referential function. So you can think of tau as being nat or nat if you like, and then you have a self-referential nat or nat, an example of which is factorial. Ah, so we make a type distinction between those functions that call themselves or might and those that count. Ah, you see, it's always good. It's always good to do this, okay? So here's what we do. So we introduce this. So the type in question, tau self, wants to be isomorphic to uh, a tau that takes itself as an argument. And then I arrange by a protocol that whenever I access one of these guys, I quickly provide it with itself as argument and uphold the invariant that it's always going to have access to itself. So how do I do that? Well, what I do is I define two operations which are called roll and unroll, and they're motivated by thinking of it in terms of a recursive function. I'm gonna unroll the recursion. It's not really tied to it being a function, but it might feel more natural to you. So I'm unrolling the recursion. So the idea is that, what does unroll do? Well, you give me a self-referential tau, whatever that is. If you like, tau is an adder or an out, just to keep your thoughts in your head. And what you do is whenever you wanna access the guy, you unroll it. So you apply unroll to a tau cell. And what does it do? Well, it unfolds the recursion because that's the limb form for the element of the recursive type because tau cell is a recursive type. It unfolds the recursion thereby moving us over to this type and then applies it to itself. So this is the, this is the coolest idea. This is the idea of self-application. And uh, Kleene and Rosser discovered this uh, when they were Church's students in the 19, uh, I suppose it would have been the 1930s, uh, 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 discovered this, uh, this idea and I'll, I'll revisit it momentarily. Okay, so that's the idea of self-application. Um, um, in, in essence, I'm taking X and applying it to itself. Well, first I have to unfold it to expose the fact that it's a function, and then I can apply it to itself. So that's, that is the idea. And then how do I create something like this? Well, I take in such a function and I just call fold. I just mark it with a fold and that's it. That's all I do. The function is labeled as being folded. And then the idea is that in the dynamics, if, if I write this down, you know, if you do something like this, uh, that I forgot to write down the dynamics, but the, the, the dynamics would be, the dynamics would be that it's quite straightforward. If I do unfold a fold of F just for, uh, yeah, for the, which is the basic thing, this just transitions to F, uh, to F. Doesn't have to be F, it's going to be any E. So, but the idea is that there being isomorphisms, they're inverse to each other. So if I do in a limb on the intro, they cancel. So that's a beta principle. And then that's inherited by roll and unroll, which are defined in terms of fold. So in particular, we have the following thing is that if you roll up some function, some self-referential thing, and you roll it up so that this is a some tau self is going on here. So this is some sort of tau self around. When you unroll it, I use the term roll for those defined concepts here on this page, then what, what it eventually steps to after a number of steps is the application of F to the thing itself. So it's really implementing self-reference because it's quickly saying, every time I wanna to touch one of these guys, it, quick, it quickly shoves itself in as the first argument before you get any chance to intervene. That's the beauty of abstraction, you see. It's an abstract type and you don't get to muck with it. Okay, this is happening behind the scenes whether you like it or not. Okay, and now uh, how do you define factorial? You just say roll fact, okay? And you should check this out. Check out that unrolling effect eventually transitions to fact of fact. It unrolls the recursion. This is capital fact is the body. Now that can be applied to a number and it branches on it, et cetera. And it calls that argument, you'll see, it calls itself via, via, this, via this observation. So if you just, you just should calculate this out. 
Now, a really, really good exercise where I decided to leave it as an exercise, uh, that's the teacher's privilege. So the, I decided to leave it as an exercise is that you can define in general now, if you use the self-type, the answer is MPFPL, but you can define the self-type in term, uh, excuse me, define fix in terms of the self-type. So now all that PCF stuff can be just, you know, blown away in favor of recursive types. So that's a very, very beautiful thing. So now we've subsumed PCF and we've gotten that language feature, so to say, to emerge from type structure. That's the way it ought to be. Okay. So when when you get that kind of understanding of it, then okay, then you're you're pretty good. Things are things are good. Okay. So that's the that's the idea. So you should define this. It's a very nice little hacking exercise. I did a very specific case for like how to define factorial, and you should be able to generalize that. Now, some of you may know this, some of you may not. So uh, I don't have time to really develop the ideas, but I just want you to, I'm just gonna point at something, uh, which is this. The origin of this idea comes from Kleene and Rosser, and they invented something called the Y Combinator, which in the Lambda Calculus, which was a very cool programming trick that is based on, oops, uh, uh, that is based on self-application. X applied to X here is the self-application. Okay, so if you don't know about it, I, I don't have time to explain it to you. But the critical thing is that if you, for example, with capitals fact, if you take its fixed point y, then you get fact of y of fact. So y of fact is little fact, and then we get little fact equals capital fact of little fact. Good, we've tied the knot. So it was a remarkable invention when Kleene, as a PhD student of churches, figured out how to do this. This is like an amazing hack. The second, the second most amazing hack was figuring out how to do the predecessor on the church numerals. And if you don't know how to do that, you should also figure that out. You're, you're all good hackers. So if you think you're a good hacker, uh, you should figure, figure out how to do that. Okay, that's a, that's a good programming exercise. Okay, good. So I don't wanna uh, take time out. Okay, so uh, let me go back to Dana's work uh, because it ties in here, because this is really a manifestation of the same thing. See, I, just, I described recursion here very explicitly in terms of self-reference. And when embedded in the Lambda calculus, it's the same idea. There's the self-application, but it, it, okay. And I wanna explain how that works. And it's not by ad hocly bunging in something. It's just like, if you know the Lambda calculus, it's the world's most elegant programming language. You can't beat it. It's the best programming language ever invented. It has exactly two constructs or three. It has variables because you always have variables as math. If you have some mathematical entity of variables that, that can be, you know, you can substitute for. Okay, so so the important thing is you have land abstraction, you have application. Done. Entire story finished. I mean, you have to admit, if you haven't studied this previously or if you remember when you did study it, I mean, that's a kick-ass idea. Like, how, how did church ever come up with this? It's uh, it's absolutely remarkable. I mean, it's the air we breathe, but it's, it's, it's nice once in a while to sit back and think, Jesus, you know, how did this ever happen? Like, and, and I don't know, don't ask me, but uh, church, I mean, uh, church was denigrated. I mean, very few people took him seriously. I mean, it, 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 you know, he has a, uh, my, my, he was, a, um, my advisor, Bob Constables told me some stories about this, but I won't repeat them here. So, but you know, he had a hard time being taken seriously. Uh, you know, go figure, right? I don't know what to say. It just took a long time before people figured out what he was talking about. So, all right. So the important point is, is that this recursive type is that what Dana is famous for. He, it solved this type equation. He wants to type D, which is isomorphic to its own function space. Now, as I mentioned to you a moment ago, if you try to think of D as sets and you try to think of arrow as being a uh, function space between sets, you can't, can't be done. Okay. At least, unless the set has exactly one element. But let's look at non-trivial. So there's no non-trivial solution in sets, okay? So that was my remark earlier. So this type is the solution to that type equation, which Dana called the domain equation because the spaces he was dealing with came to be called Scott domains. Everything in that area is named after Dana. So it's a Scott this and a Scott that, it's got the other. So I, I get to mention, I get to mention those. Okay. and and what is the key idea? It's right here. I put this corners in here that says, if you take a lambda term that I just described to you, how do we interpret it as an element of this type? Well, all you do is put in your folds and unfolds. 
So whenever you have a lambda, which is supposed to be a function, then, and remember that the, the domain of a function is the, all, is the lambda term. So you have only one type. And that's a critical idea. So what you do is you, you take the function, which it's saying lambda x in D now, because D is the type that we're considering, and you just encode M and you fold that because after all, the thing that is highlighted will have type D or D, write it like that. And then I fold it and I'll put it back into D. And then on application correspondingly, I unfold, I have to unfold the function to expose the underlying function and then plug in the argument and I'm done. So here, you see, then you do the work to do self-application because you count, okay? Rather than me doing the work for you as I did in the previous slide, uh, here I'm leaving it for you to do work, that's the Y combinator. So I hope this will help you. I've seen a number of, of popular expositions of the Y combinator, none of which I find very convincing or enlightening. Uh, I think this is the right way to do it. You think in terms of recursive types. And, and so, and the idea of self-application. I don't want to dwell on it any further. Okay, so this was Dana's great discovery in the 1960s. Now, and it was the foundation for programming language semantics, everything from there that provided a foundation, let, let me say it another way, it provided a foundation for ideas that Strachey was developing more or less simultaneously, but didn't know how to like make good sense of it all on the combination of Gott and Strachey invented the notational semantics. So that's the idea. Okay, I won't say any more of that. Okay, so now here's the important thing, which maybe you probably know, but there's, there's, there, there is an ever shall be apparently opposition to types. Go figure, I don't know, I, I, it's beyond me. But actually it's not totally beyond me because I realized that those people who are opposed to types, what they really mean is they want only one type in the world. All, all right, I mean, there's no accounting for taste, right? I, 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 I don't know what to say there. You know, if somebody thinks that it's advantageous to have only one type, well, here's how you do it. So that's what they're actually doing. So what I wanted to point out is that if you have any kind of untype, really what Dana emphasizes, unitype programming language, then what is that unitype that, it, that they're all obsessed with? Well, it's a big recursive sum type. And here I've taken the liberty to give labels to the some ands because it's easier to keep track of them. And I just wrote down something off the top of my head. Take your favorite untyped programming language, which is supposedly opposed to the idea of type. It's actually foolishly tied up with the notion of type and foolishly it tries to evade them unsuccessfully. And I'll explain why. It's in a colossal mess. This can never be made sane. However, if you prefer, you prefer it. I can't help you. I, don't, I, don't, I can't account for taste, okay? But here's the idea. So you just have a universal type U, I called it, which is a recursive type that has a bunch of clauses. And the clauses are labeled by classes. Please, I insist. These are classes, not types. And these, in those languages, they often refer to runtime type checking. And that's just erroneous terminology. That's not what's going on. And I'll show you. It's class dispatch. It's dynamic dispatch, it's what I told you last time, or first time uh, on Monday, okay? It all ties in, okay? So here we go, you make this recursive type. So you have a bunch of clauses, because you say, well, what, what classes of data do I want? Well, invariably there's sort of nil, which has no, no associated value at all. So it associated value is, is unit, okay? And cons is ordered pairs. So I can smash ordered pairs down and of values in U and call that a value of U. And I might have Booleans, which is, uh, have uh, one and one, sum of one and one, uh, those are true and false. Or I might have functions like u error u, or more to the point, what you find is u to the n, some n array functions. And sometimes you even get n array, multiple arguments as well as multiple results. And I'm gonna point out in a few minutes that this is the thin edge of the wedge because every one of these goddamn languages has multi-argument functions. But that is nothing more than admitting that there's more than one type that you're interested in having several things of type U, in other words, an element of type U cross U cross U. Oh, so you see that the story doesn't even hang together on its own terms, but never mind, never mind, okay? And then they go into multiple results and you think, what are these insane people thinking? It just means return a tuple. Oh, right, we can't admit there are tuples because we're doctrinally opposed to types. So we call them multiple results. This is complete nut job land, uh, except it's, it's absolutely the most popular thing going, okay? I can never understand it. 
So I have to say, as an educator, I feel it's a failure of education. But here I am, a summer school, so um, maybe I can do better. So if you do this, uh, if you take this 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 equation, in fact, Dana emphasized this point a long time ago. As soon as I tell you this equation, I've told you 99% of what you need to know about the language, because everything else follows, follows from those. Okay. So for example, you can define what the Booleans are. Uh, I use the scheme notation, but you know you can do whatever you like. Um, sharp T was true. It, you have to fold it because you have to get it into the recursive type. You have to tag it as a being class pool, and then you have to form the bit one dot the null tuple in order to get into the sum of one and one. And false, you put it with two. So you fold it, you label it as a Boolean, you label it as either true or false. That's what's really going on. And then how does the conditional work? Well, it takes in the thing you're going to conditionalize on and the two things you're going to branch on. And then the idea is that you unfold you. And if it, I use pattern matching notation here because it's a little heavy if I don't. Uh, it says, well, if you're the Boolean true, then it's U1. If you're the Boolean false, then it's U2. Oh, 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 oh wait, 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 wait. When I unfold U, what is its type? Well, it's a big ass sum. And it isn't necessarily a Boolean. It could be a nil or a con. Oh, Christ. So now I have to put in a whole bunch of clauses, all of which raise an error. But mind you, this is a feature. This is not a bug. You must understand this is a feature. Don't ask me why, but it's a feature. Okay, this is like, this is good for you. Okay, it is alleged. Okay, so the, the poor if has to actually check for all the other cases too, because after all, it's untyped. Nobody says that the thing you're, you're branching on is actually Boolean. Then there's all sort of ruses to, to like make that sort of semi work, but it never works in the end. Okay. Okay, so then uh, a subject came up on Slack today is this idea of Boolean blindness, which I wanted to mention. So in those situations um, in such languages, you have predicates like cons question mark. I use something vaguely reminiscent of, of, of scheme notation. I've forgotten actually what they call it. Might be pair question mark, but anyway, whatever it is. Um, so cons question mark takes in an element of the universal phase and then it unfolds it and then it case analyzes. And if it does happen to be a con, it says true, and then it has a whole bunch of other cases for false. Okay, there's nothing wrong with that so far until you realize now, suppose I wanted to find head and tail, which are the car and the cooter. Well, how do I do that? Well, I take in something which could be anything whatsoever, and I unfold it and I examine it. And if it is a cons and it does, therefore it has a, a head element, then, uh, oops, something, um, something happened here. This was supposed to say H, that's your answer in that case. And otherwise, you have to raise a run, raise a runtime error, because you're taking head carve carve nil. That's a famous one. Okay, so you're taking head of head of nil, and you have to raise an error. And now consider this is best done offline. Suppose you look at a conditional branch like this. Okay, you check whether x is a cons, and in the case that it is, you take its head. D compile all that in the way I've showed you, and look at how ridiculous that piece of code is. It explains why languages like Python are factors of like 3,000 slower than ML. And it'll never be thus. Because it's built in all this overhead. I mean, to my way of thinking, there is not one iota of gain in any of this. It is lose all the way. It's lose in terms of efficiency. It's lose in terms of expressive power. So it's good for what? I, I, I don't know. Maybe making banking websites that crash on me within 30 seconds. That, that I can definitely say it's good. It's definitely good for that. So if the purpose it's more is employment, right? me, then it's really successful. Say again? Creates more employment. <laughs> Creates more employment, employment. Yes, oh, it's employment, yes, okay, good. Yes. So I want you to check this out. So this is a good exercise for you. I think uh, it's, uh, it's very, uh, very useful for you is, is expand that and see what's actually going on. And then you will think, oh my God, because what I have found when I have explained this kind of thing to students in the past, their first reaction is they tell me, obviously he's wrong, he doesn't know what he's talking about. And then they go back and look at the compiled code and come back to me and I've had this happen, uh, looking like they've seen a ghost because they cannot believe that this thing that all the cool kids thinks is really great is so in fact awful. And I say, that's why God gave us PL theory. Okay, so this is this is the thing to keep in mind. All right, so look at that and see how absurd these things actually are. Okay, all right, good. Now, 
in, in something like a language like that, there's no cure for the Boolean blindness because you can't get at the underlying thing. And what is it that I mean? I mentioned already the symptom of multiple arguments or multiple results. That's nothing but an admission that there exists a type u to the n. You know, n full copy of u, u, u cross u cross u. So you're really admitting you have types when you have multiple arguments. Okay. It's a slippery slope. This is a losing proposition. The, the premise of the discussion, the premise of the design does not hold together and never will. Okay, so that's the thing I, I want to mention. So, okay, so this is the, the kind of thing that happens. And, uh, okay, yeah, so that's, that's where I was. On the other hand, if I look at this as a recursive type that occurs in a language that is a type language that happens to have recursive types, oh, maybe ML, for example, or Haskell, uh, then you could, of course, do all this in a totally sensible way. And moreover, because of the miracle of Milner's type inference algorithm, you never write a type down on the page. So the, 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 the complaint is what? Beats me. I, I have no idea. Okay. However, these things are gigantically popular. So I don't know. I'm not wrong in the technicalities, but obviously I'm missing something because uh, the, the, the whole world seems to disagree with me. So I, all I can do is that by way of being honest with you, is that's the case. Okay, good. So that's what I wanted to say about recursive types. I, I wanted to get that in I, and, and to sort of relate it to the Lambda calculus a little bit and tell you the role of recursive types and how that comes into play with so-called untyped programming languages like the untyped Lambda calculus. They're really just unityped and you're robbing yourself of expressive power for some reason. Okay, so there you go. All right. I mean, yeah, okay, I'll leave it, leave it at that. Okay, so now what I wanna do is I wanna move on and I wanna talk about other things that kind of fall out of this setup that I've given you with the lax modality. And so, so far, as I said earlier, what I've done, uh, done here at the outset is to use them to uh, manage control effects, like to, so that we, because these things demand control over the order of evaluation. And I mentioned war stories about, you know, landmines, uh, exception landmines and lazy languages where you don't have order control of the order of evaluation and then but you do have exceptions because you have to and then you know you're in a world of hurt okay it's like why are you doing this okay but anyway that's the way it is so you need to have control over the order of evaluation and so i suggested doing this using the lax modality that's my thing and i did mention also this a more refined version of this called call by push value but for now i'm i'm just i'm just chosen not to talk about that Okay, uh, other than to tip my hat. Okay, so, okay, I'll mention that. Okay, good. So now um, uh, what I wanna say is the, the, the lax modality, okay, which uh, I uh, misspelled here for some unknown reason. So the lax modality is, uh, okay, is also useful for managing storage effects. And in fact, uh, if you've run across this sort of thing before, that might have been the first thing you saw. I just happened to be doing things in another order. Um, the, the question came up on Slack, which I, I'm not really able to answer meaningfully uh, uh, at the moment is, can we keep these apart? And let me not just, I'm just not going to go there. Okay, so I'm gonna have this big, uh, as Peyton Jones calls it, the sin, a big sin bin, uh, in which everything that isn't pure functional mathy looking thing is going to be chucked into the lax modality to mark it as being, uh, uh, you know, uh, the rated X. You have to like uh, willfully click yes before you go in there. Okay, so that's uh, so that's what what uh, what I'm doing. Okay, so um, all right. So what I want to talk about is a uh, language called modernized Algol, and I call it modernized Algol in homage to Reynolds. I may have mentioned this before. Reynolds had formulated. He's the one who called my attention to what I'm going to show you. He formulated a language called idealized Algol, and I differ from him in a certain way that he really cares about. So I ended up, he didn't want me to use the word idealized Algol for that reason. So I call it modernized Algol because it rhymes. So that's the actual reason. And also it's modernized, okay? So uh, in a certain respect. And so I thought, oh, that's a nice name. So I call it modernized Algol in homage to Reynolds, acknowledging that he doesn't agree with me on a certain point which I'll come back to in a minute. Okay, so what is modernized algo? Well, it lacks PCF with storage effects, in particular with state. And in its most, uh, in its most um, 
skeletal form, it's exactly the language algol 60 that we had in 19, algol that we had in 1960. And uh, there's an aphorism that I think seems to have expired, but some of you may have heard before, that algol is, uh, is famous for being a very substantial improvement in nearly all of its successors. Oh, that is absolutely true. There's no question about that. In fact, algol these days it goes by another name, which I will come back with, come back to a little bit later. Okay, we still have a very uh, widely used prominent dialect of algol that uh, is, uh, is, uh, is, is in regular use. I'll come back to that in a minute. So the main thing about what's going on with modernized algol, and, and this is actually distinct from what Reynolds was doing, is I want to be very careful to distinguish between what I call assignables. I, as far as I know, I made up that word, okay? Uh, which are distinct from variables. This is a thing that is confused in every programming language in the world and is one of the most regrettable mistakes ever made in my opinion. So the idea is that an assignable is a thing you can assign to, that's why I call it that, okay? And a variable is a thing that you learned in math, which is an unknown. And the characteristic of variables is you can plug in for them as, as the terminology goes in school, and meaning you can just perform substitution. They're simply pronouns that stand for an unknown value of appropriate type. So when you first start out, you only have variables which stand for real numbers and you plug in any real number, but as you get more sophisticated, you other, have other, other things you could range, variables range over. Okay, and I want to distinguish those from assignables, which are things for which you can do a gut and a set. And they're not the same thing, God damn it. Okay, so that's table pounding point, okay, that I want to make. Reynolds, in fact, likes to confuse the assignables with the variable. That was a feature for him. I will just flag that and say, uh, you know, I'm impressed with the fact that he liked this idea because to me it's terrible. So all, that's all I can say. So Reynolds is by far the, uh, you know, one of the greatest computer scientists ever. So I defer to him in that regard, but I don't actually know why, why he thinks that's a good idea. I don't. Okay, so I just want to, I'll just say this out loud. Okay, so the critical idea is, so I write approximately, so for this reason, I wanna mention it's approximately equal to Reynolds' idealized algo, but only approximately. Okay, so what happens in this setting is, uh, I'm gonna think of computations as now encompassing not only the control effects, but also the storage effects. So I'll call them commands. So tau comp can, is sort of synonymous now with tau command. It can be the same thing. It's just once I'm in the, once I'm in this setting, calling them commands seems more natural because it, they have that flavor, the imperative flavor. So, so, so I want to do that. Okay, so the, the critical idea that I will come back to in a minute is to introduce, so we, we have our setup with lax PCF, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna populate the, well, what I now call the command level, the computation level, or the command level, the little Ms. I'm gonna add some new things over there. And the critical one is what I, is the declaration. Which can be which can be uh, which uh, can be written like this. I want to allocate an assignable, which I'll call A, which is initialized to which is initialized to the value of E, okay, for use within an assignable M. That is the idea. So I'm going to declare A to be initialized to E, and its type will be whatever the type of E is. Or here I explicitly indi indicated that a type is sigma. So the initializer is an expression of type sigma and the command is allowed to use the assignable A. And in yellow here, I've augmented the typing judgment with a sigma which decorates the turn style. And because I insist that assignables are not variables, I don't put the assignables in gamma, gamma is for variables. There you expect to have cut you a substitution transitivity, however you like to say it, there should be an entailment relation. With sigma, no, with no such thing. Okay, I don't want any such thing. Uh, and in particular, because I don't want any such thing, one reason I don't want any such thing is I, I don't want any form of substitution for them because I expect to be able to branch on whether assignables A and B are the same or not. For variables, that concept makes no sense because whether X is equal to Y can be true or false depending on what you plug in for X and Y. It doesn't make sense to refer to whether X is equal to Y because they're just placeholders for other things. But when I have assignables, it's a different deal altogether. They're what are called names or symbols that do have a notion of this equality. And that's important. 
Okay, so that's the reason semantically, a reason semantically why I do not want to confuse assignables and variables. And in the formalism I've set up, I don't do that. Okay, so that's the, the reason. Okay, so that's what we're, what we're doing. And, uh, and so that's the setup. I'm gonna come back to this, but, and I put a big asterisk here because this isn't the full story, but uh, I need to develop ideas. So uh, we'll come back to it. So that's why I put that asterisk there, just to remind you that I have to do that. Okay, and now what I do is I augment this PCF, lax PCF. I, at the computation are now called command level, as you like. I'm gonna add in besides declare, that's declare is a new form of command. And, uh, and, it, and I have these two other forms of command called set and get, that will not surprise you, okay? So the idea is that if I have a round and assignable of type tau, then the operation get of A, get A, it's, I think of the assignables as indexing a family of get and set operations. So this is the eighth instance of the get family. Uh, that's a good way to think about it. Okay, that the assignable names are indices for family of operators. Ah, that's the key. Operators in the sense of ABTs, which I told you about on Monday. Okay, so get A is, uh, is, uh, is the operation that gets the contents of assignable A. It's a command that uh, yields in the weak sense, something of type tau. So it's a command It has to be executed. And then when it's executed, then it will return the contents of the assignable A. Well, what would that be? Well, it's initialized E, oops. So if I've if it's in its, so to say, initialized state, then, then it will return that value. It'll, that'll be evaluated and it will return that value. I can also change its state and that's what it's doing here. Okay, so it's analogous. It says if I have some expression E of type tau and A is an assignable of type tau, then I can set it to have its contents be E. So this is unsurprising. This is A colon equals E. It's just that in standard programming languages, there's no notation for this. In, in, in ML, it would be something approximately like, you know, uh, bang A, okay? And other languages have something similar, okay? But, but it's common, almost every programming language you run into confuses variables and assignables. And why is that? Because in the 1950s, people were like trying to write numeric codes in assembly language and it's a bitch. So the great invention was Fortran which let you write down for memory locations, you know, A, B, and C, you were able to write down A squared plus two, two, A, two B plus one or something like that, where these are actually mutable. These are assignables, okay? Uh, and that was a huge invention. That was like the greatest innovation in the 1950s. And unfortunately it's stuck. And it's a, and let me tell you why I sort of feel it's a bad idea. And it comes right here. If assignables are variables, then, then A plus A should be the same as two times A, right? <laughs> That's not supposed to be controversial if they're natural numbers or whatever, some numeric type. But you see, that is not true, okay? That isn't true because if I have concurrency, then you this is taking two bytes at the apple and that guy is taking one byte at the apple, meaning fetching the contents of that assignable. And right in between, you know, the devil is doing the scheduling and the devil has nothing better to do than to screw you over. So what's gonna happen is it's gonna schedule it so that another thread mutates the assignable in between the two fetches. And now A plus A is not the same as two times A. So this is a good idea? No. Someone remarked on chat, Bacchus who invented Fortran in the 50s, re repudiated it and, and advocating for functional programming. Starting around 19, he won the touring right around 1980. I, I don't remember exactly, but it's, 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 it's in that neck of the woods, 80, 81, someone can tell me. And uh, it, it was, the title of his touring lecture was called, Can Programming Be Liberated from the Von Neumann Style? And the what he meant is, uh, can we do functional programming instead of imperative programming based on machines? Because it's really terrible to be basing on machines. So uh, it was one of the founding, founding events and the, subject of functional programming that you always know about and probably love if you're here. So uh, so that's the, uh, on a little background. So curiously, the guy who did that and to begin with eventually repudiated, but on the other hand, it doesn't matter because the whole world still does the same way. And, and then you get endless, 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 endless problems because for example, oh, compilers love to optimize things. And they say, oh, it'll replace A plus A by two A. Yeah, except for the fact that they're not equal. 
what are you doing? Okay, it's completely nuts. And if you want to know a similar thing, you, it's very entertaining. You should read uh, William Kahan's articles about floating point arithmetic and what compilers do with floating point and what an atrocity is. You'll enjoy it. He's, uh, he writes a very, very, very acerbic article criticizing uh, the treatment of floating point. And it's the same idea that it's the same mentality that says I should replace that when those are assignables is the same mentality that says you should simplify arithmetic expressions on the theory that floats are actually reals when they're not. So it's, uh, it's a thing to think about. Okay, anyway, enough of that. All right, hey, so- Bob, can I interrupt? Uh, um, I had a little okay. misunderstanding maybe with uh, your point on adding a cut rule to the colon, to the tilde colon uh, judgment. Uh, so why is it yeah. that you cannot add a cut rule yeah. there? Is it that it makes no sense somehow? Or does cut elimination fail? Well, well, what I'm doing is get and set our command that if they return, re return a value of type tau in each case. Oh, it's sort of arbitrary. I made set return E when you, but I could have also made this unit if I wanted. Uh, that, that part is not important. But the idea is that there are commands that they're analogous to things that might diverge. There are things that may have an effect, namely the storage effect. Okay, so that's the idea. Another way to say it is the things that I classify with the weak typing are ones that are context sensitive. You see, because two plus two is always four, no matter where it occurs, okay? But contents of A is not the contents of A wherever it occurs, if you see what I mean, because uh, uh, it changes. So okay, which is why you can't for the, cut. okay. Yeah, so another way of saying it is um, I'm, I'm isolating context sensitivity. That's a, another way of understanding like what the idea of an effect is, okay? That the context you're in matters, okay? So the beauty of beauty of functional programming is it doesn't because equality is a congruence and you can just reason equationally and life's good. Okay, so, you know, I'm all in favor of that. Okay, so, all right, so that's what I'm doing there. And the same with the declaration. And you'll see when I do the dynamics, we'll see how this comes up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to derive for you two notions of the dynamics of modernized algol. I'm going to derive for you uh, in this setting the actual original dynamics for declare, what 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 declare meant, which was uh, which is that they are scoped. The idea is assignables are scoped and they cannot escape their scope. And an algol that was achieved, it was achieved in a particularly brutal manner because of the limitations of computers in the 19 in literally 1960 were such that, that certain kinds of things couldn't be considered. I'll come back to that a little bit later. Uh, but anyway, what I want to get at is the idea of scope assignable. And then I want to uh, get at the idea of scope-free assignables, which are ones which are, well, in a manner of speaking that I will clarify, are allowed to escape their scope. To be honest, nothing can ever escape a scope. That, that notion makes no sense, but I'm going to show you how to make sense of that informal idea. Okay, so that's what I'm going to do. All right, now, in order to do this, I have to explain to you, uh, I'm gonna give you a transition system as I did before for LAX PCF. I'm gonna give you a transition system that accounts for state. Okay, so that's uh, for the mutation of, uh, of assignables. And in order to do that, I have needed to have a richer notion of state than I had before. So previously, I just said, oh, it's a state is a command and I, or a yeah, computation or command and I just, do transition on those commands because I didn't need to worry about it. But when I'm when I'm working here, I need to worry about what is the command that is running, what are the scopes of the assignables, and what are the contents of those assignables. Those have to all be taken into account. And the way I'm going to do this is use Milner's idea of a process calculus. So it's actually the idea of pi calculus, if you want to know. So Robin was somebody I had the privilege to work with, and who I whose work I admire enormously. And one of the things he invented besides ML, as if that isn't enough, uh, is uh, the idea of the pi calculus. Have you ever heard about this? Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to emphasize here, introduce you to some key ideas of pi calculus, and use them to represent the state of an imperative program. Because after all, my view is it's in a concurrent program, and I think this is a this is a good this is I I'm going to try to show you or convince you that's a good idea. That this is the right way to think about it. Okay, so that's what I'm going to do. One of the reasons it's the right way to think about it is that by next lecture, I'll be able to talk about 
shared memory concurrency, and I'll show you that it falls right out of what I'm doing. Very nice thing to do. But right now, I'm not going to worry about the concurrent execution of programs, but I'm using concurrency to describe the state of a computation. OK, so let's watch and see what I do here. Uh, so you're with me so far, at least. Are you at least game? I hope you're, I hope you're at least game. So my, my goal in these lectures, as I've said several times, is I'm, you're, you're supposed to let this stuff wash over you. And some of it, you'll think, oh, that's interesting. And you'll follow up on it. At least that's my hope. So my objective is to intrigue you and to give you a few technicalities in the lay of the land. OK, so here I am. Now I'm going to throw in process calculus uh, on my third, my third lecture. OK, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce uh, four forms of process, which are written here. The four forms of process are written here. OK, so I'm going to have a process which is running a command M. I'll call it run of M for some reason. Then I'm going to have, I'll, I'll skip to the bottom here, the concurrent composition of two processes. I'm going to have many processes running at once. So that's the, that's the idea. I want to think of everything in terms of uh, execution, uh, concurrent execution. And then I'm going to have a notion of a process which I write A hook E, which is that assignable A contains the contents E. And the way you're supposed to think about this is that this is a server. I want you to think of a memory cell, a mutable cell as a server that responds to messages to get and set it. That's what I want to do. So you have a bunch of servers, which are these memory cells, and they're named by assignables. And the names are introduced using this new, uh, the, the, the notation comes from Milner. It, that in my handwriting, that's supposed to be the Greek letter new, new, which uh, in American English is the same as new. Uh, and so it pronounced the same as new, but the British, the British don't pronounce it that way. Uh, but the, anyway, the reason it's called new is because it sounds like new, especially from an American. So the, so the idea is that I have a new assignable whose contents is of type tau. That's what I'm indicating here for use within a process P. So this is my allocation of an assignable. This is a cell named A, and this is a program, a command M that is being run, and it'll be run concurrently. We'll have a whole bunch of cells running concurrently with a main program. And in this setting, I'm only gonna have one main program. So it will be, in a manner of speaking, a non-concurrent program. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, I would be able to prove a deterministic theorem about the language but I first have to like tell you what the language is. So it's gonna to be pr totally deterministic. So it's a good old sequential, as it were, programming language, uh, but and actually under the hood, it's concurrent. And why am I doing this? Well, you'll see, I find, I find this formulation fun. So that's my main reason. I think it's a cool way to think about it. Uh, but the, the other reason is I wanna make a meta point, which is that, uh, Concurrency is a principle of composition. It has nothing to do with running at the same time, even though it comes from concurro. Never mind that. That's just a misleading. That's a pity that it's called that. It's a principle of composition. It's non-deterministic composition. So I'm using a nice notion of composition to define the semantics of a deterministic language. That's kind of, that's my actual inner message here. That's why I'm doing this. Okay. But anyway, we can look at it on the surface. And on the surface, I'm just doing this random stuff for you. Okay. So here's the random stuff I'm doing. Okay. Um, so here's the statics of this thing. I want to tell you what counts as uh, processes. So the idea is a command that returns a value of type tau, if it does, it, it can be wrapped up as a process. I don't care what tau is, it doesn't matter. Okay. We're going to, we're, we're, you know, it's irrelevant to me. Okay. You can run it, command returning any type. I don't care. Okay, so and then you can run it. So that's a form of process. And it, ev oops, everything in sight is indexed by the signature sigma, which is keeping track of the available assignables. So you'll see where that comes up right here. Because then new, new A, P, I'll pronounce it like that. New A and P is a process over sigma. If P is a process over sigma with A allocated. So that's the idea there. So the assignable name A is available. And then I have. A, a form of process, as long as you have an assignable around, there's a process that says a hook E, which says that E is the contents of the assignable A. That's the intuition. It's a server that, as I'll see, you'll see in a moment, responds to get and set requests for its contents. So that's what's going on there. And then I can take the parallel composition uh, of two processes. I can run them. You can think of it as running them in parallel, but I think it's very misleading to use the word parallel, even the word 
even though the notation is Euclid's parallel symbol, but never mind. Uh, never mind that. I think it's misleading to, to, you shouldn't confuse parallelism with concurrency. Let me just say that, wrap it up, put it aside. We can talk about it later, okay? But it's common to think that they're somehow one has something to do with the other and they don't. So I, I want to stress that. So, so it's really just a way of composing programs, period. That's it. All right. Now, as I did before, I'm going to have equations that govern these things. So a while ago, namely Monday, it seems like months already to me, at least. Uh, I hope it's not that tedious. The, the, um, not because of tedium, it's just because of so many, so many thoughts getting, coming out of my head, but it seems like a long time ago. But on Monday, I talked to you about definitional equivalence of expressions, and I want to have that for processes. This is a customary thing that one does. And the way it's, uh, the way it's axiomatized is it's an equivalence relation. So reflexive and symmetric transitive, it's compatible with new and parallel. So in other words, if P1 is the same as P1 prime and P2 is the same as P2 prime, then their parallel composition are equal. So that's what it means to be a congruence or to be compatible. And the similar thing with new that I can do the parallel, I can replace uh, th that if the bodies are equal, then the news are equal. Okay, so we do that. It's also compatible with, with expression equivalence that comes up because of the contents of E. Okay, so there's an E comes up here and we stipulate that composition is associative and commutative. So in other words, P1 in parallel with P2 is considered to be the same as P1 in P2 in parallel with P1. The order doesn't matter. And there's no contours, it's, it's associative. So that's the setup. So this in Milner's terminology is called uh, structural congruence, except that in pi calculus, there's, there's item five, which I've suppressed here. I'll come back to that a little bit later and I'll show you why. Okay, so uh, I'll, get, I'll get to that in a few minutes. Okay, so, so think of it as the processes are modded out by this, by this equivalence relation. That is, I work with equivalence classes and everything would be well-defined with respect to these equivalent classes. I won't care, it won't matter to me whether a process is to the left of another one. That, that, like, that doesn't exist. Okay, so I just make it commutative. That's the idea. Okay, so so I do that. So that's what I'm going to do here. So you're learning about process calculus here. So now here's the heart of the process calculus. The heart of the process calculus is the idea of using labeled transition, lab, labeled transition, which is written here. That is, there's an action alpha which labels the transition. But when I say p transitions to p prime, the sigma is there just to keep for bookkeeping purposes, keeping the the names, the assignables that are around. But the idea is that uh, uh, the idea is that the um, the transition is labeled with an action alpha. So the important thing is there are actions. One is the null action. So the null action, I won't even bother to write. I won't explicitly put it down. I just omit it. And if you like, it's rather similar to the notion of an epsilon transition in automata theory. That's exactly what it is, and that's exactly where I borrowed the terminology of the notation from. So that's why. I write it like that. Uh, the connection to atomic theory is fascinating. If you look in the supplements, uh, supplemental notes to PFPL, there's a note there about uh, deriving process calculus from atomic theory. And uh, it tickles me. I, I, I really like that, uh, that way of thinking about things. So you can look there if you want. Okay, anyway, there's that. And now there's two other forms of action, which is I'm querying the assignable A for its value and I'm signaling the assignment A to have the value V. So the things that are on the labels of the transitions represent the side effects, the, amb the effects on the ambient context. That's the entire idea of it. The whole purpose of labeling them is to express that, oh, you know, when I put that label on here, the reason I do it is somebody else cares about the effect I just had. That's what is going on. So the way that is formulated in process calculus is to define the notion of complementary actions, which I close in down here because I forgot to write it further up and I just bunged it in there uh, when I was writing my slides. So you have the idea of complementary action. So the null action is self-complementary. So don't worry about that. But the point is, and you're gonna, you're, as you could guess, 
the the query and the signal are complementary for each other. So if I if I'm querying V on A, then I, that the dual of that is I'm signaling V on A. And similarly, if I signal V on A, then that's querying V on A. So it's complementary action. The reason I care about that is written in yellow. Because if I have in parallel composition, remember order doesn't matter, associativity doesn't matter. So pick J random two processes, P1 and P2, which are around. If it, one can take an action in alpha and the other can take a complementary action, then they can hold hands and take the null action uh, and, and evolve together. This is our synchronization mechanism. So this is at the heart of process calculus. If you've never run across process calculus before, this is the core of it. Like this is, this is what it's all about. Using label transitions to model effects on the environment. The environment means the other processes that are running and they interact. They, at this point, they synchronize and hold hands and proceed together jointly. Okay, so that's the, that's the idea. Now, everything else that's written here just says, uh, if P1 can take an action alpha, then the fact that P2 is hanging around is of no, is immaterial. The parallel composition of them can take the corresponding action and transition, okay? Because P1 couldn't care less. I, I don't mind you watching me take any of these actions. So if, you, if, you, if you're watching, I don't care. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm uh, rather uh, shameless. I, I will take these actions shamelessly, okay? So that's what's being said here, that, that, the, that it's a shameless action. Okay, so we can write that. And then um, for running M, well, guess what? If I, can, if I can make progress on a command and simplify it, so to speak, take a transition on M to M prime, then I can make a transition on it as a running process. And for the new, I can descend underneath the new. So the important thing here is notice that the signature grew when I went up above to, 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 uh, make, to work on the P. So the point is I can just get the news out of my way and execute or simplify as it were, okay, uh, then, um, uh, oh yeah, well then uh, uh, Ian Graham, uh, have a look at that note, you'll enjoy it. No, oh, somebody linked it, yep. Uh, so yeah, have a look at it, you'll enjoy it. Uh, at least I did. Okay, so uh, so this is the, uh, this is the, just says, you know, I, I can execute underneath the binder. Okay, so that's a critical idea. Okay. And now here's the fun part. So the fun part is the way I express side effects is by using side effects, which are called actions. So here's the intuition. I said to you before that this pro ah, I said to you before that this process is to be thought of as a server, and the server is willing to serve two kinds of messages. You can query it for its value, and you can instruct it to change its value. Ah, so the so the idea is. You should look at it like this. Uh, let me get my, okay, good. You should look at it, look at this rule first. This says that the server is continuously willing to inform anybody who cares what its current value is. So it's the it's A hook V. It is willing to announce to the world that, that should say A, not alpha. I don't know why I have a typo here. Oops, this is, uh, this is supposed to be A. The actions are called alpha, that's the particular action A. So it's announcing to the world that A contains B. So that's what it's doing. On the other hand, the very same server is also willing to synchronize with uh, any other process who wishes to change it. It says, oh, by the way, if, if you want, I'm willing to, uh, to respond to your request to change my value. So A hook V, if it receives such V, v prime, then it becomes A hook V prime. So it changes its contents. All right. So this, this, so these, uh, these two rules that are written here, are uh, encapsulating the idea that the cell is a server. So that's what I'm doing, and the server is running parallel with the main program, as it were. And the main program is the thing we're running. That's why I call it run. And now you're going to guess what I'm going to do. If you're running a get on a, then what you do is you. You make a, you're willing to make a transition in which you query the contents of A. And the point being, if you now look at what it means to be a complementary action, then what happens is this guy can synchronize with that guy. This guy is willing, if it's A is the same, then this guy is willing to announce that its value is B. This guy is asking what is its value, which it 
it's not deterministically guessing what the value is and it synchronizes with that server and then it returns that value. And a similar thing happens here. If I'm running a set, then I announce to the server, you should change your value to B and then it returns that value. Okay, so that's how, it, that's how it's done. I formulate the, I formulate the dynamics of, of modernized algol in terms of concurrent programs, both because it sets me up for things I wanna say, but also because, I don't know, I think it's a neat idea. So now let me show you going back to, are we okay with this? You should jump in and ask questions if you, if you wish. I know, I know that I'm going fast, but uh, I'm hoping you can get the drift. Okay, so this is the idea. So now, um, uh, then uh, the, the only other thing I, I had to worry about is how do we run a bind? Well, we just run the, the first command and any actions, any actions it can take are propagated upwards. So they're written here. So that's all that's being said here. That's a technicality, let's not worry about it. Okay, now let's go back to declarations. All right, because I now want to say, how do we account for declarations in this setting? So the reason I set up uh, the process calculus uh, as a framework for states is so that I can talk about allocation and the get and the set. So the get and the set are handled by synchronization between the cell and the running, the running command. And now here's allocation. So if I'm gonna run a declaration, then what do I do? I take a so-called epsilon transition, uh, a silent transition uh, all by myself. And what I do is I allocate an assignable A, I fork off a new server saying its contents is E, and I continue by running M. So that's the, that's the idea. So this is, this is how we execute a declare. And now a nifty, nifty thing, uh, now a nifty thing comes up, okay? What I wanna say, and it, I'm putting double question marks here, which I'm going to explain. If I want to think of this declare as being stack allocated, then I would like to be able to deallocate. This allocates the assignable, that's what we said here. I wanna be able to deallocate it when I'm, when I'm finished. Well, when is it, when am I finished? When the command I'm running becomes return of a value. So the idea is that if the command, which is the body of the declare finishes, then I can abandon the assignable A and I can abandon the cell server that is telling me the contents of it. Can't I? Isn't that the whole idea of stack allocation? Okay, that when you're, you, you introduce it in the scope and when you're done with it, then it is deallocated. Original algol implemented assignables this way because they didn't dare broach the subject of heap allocation, which I'll come up to later. But they can be forgiven for 1960 because Edgar Dijkstra, one of my heroes, invented the implementation of recursive procedures for the purpose of writing the first algorithm compiler. So the idea that you take for granted part of our everyday bread and butter of functions that call themselves or procedures that call themselves, the implementation of that was non-trivial and, uh, and Dijkstra's want to figure that out. So yeah, and it almost didn't even get into the language. He had to like really push, if you look at the history, he had to really push to get that in. But it's one of the great innovations of all time, if you ask me. Okay, so part of it is that when you exit the scope of the declaration, you're supposed to deallocate the assignable. Oh, really? Okay, really? Well, let me jump to the bottom of this thing here. This little example might look familiar to you. It's some C code that you've probably seen before. This is the canonical example of an ill-defined C program where I have some function, procedure, command, uh, whatever you want to call it, um, called bad, which returns a pointer to an integer, as it were, of the terminology in C. It returns an int star, so the int star bad, and how does it do it? Well, you go inside the body of this procedure, you allocate A, you say int A, they don't even bother to initialize it, and you return ampersand A, yay. Boo, something's wrong. This is the famous thing, okay, because I'm returning a pointer to something that no longer exists because the moment I exit the scope of this declaration that introduces A on the stack, then uh, as soon as I exit, I have a pointer into the middle of the stack I just popped, stack frame I just popped. Uh-oh, this is ill-defined. Lots of bugs of this form uh, exist in C code. The language is not properly defined. So I'm gonna show you what to do about this situation, but but this is what I'm gonna get at. In order to tell you what I'm gonna do, what I'm pointing out is 
if you look, you can prove an invariant about the shapes of the states according to the dynamics I just sketched for you. And the idea is that the states are shaped like this. They're shaped like a stack. I allocate an assignable, I have a server associated with it in parallel with allocating assignable, I have a server associated with it, a bunch of those things. And then I'm running them deep inside these declares. So every time I do a declare, I make a new frame in which I allocate an assignable, that's the frame. And I put a server there notionally, right? That's the idea. And I keep doing that and that's where I'm running. So it's a good thing to keep in mind. So, so that's what motivates this because it kind of says, well, at the innermost, the innermost one of these, when you're done, you ought to be able to then deallocate it. That's the whole point of stack allocation. It's a garbage collector that works in a certain way. Now we see here from C is that the, the garbage collector built into C uh, didn't actually work. The, the language promises more than it can deliver. Okay, so what do we do about this? Okay, so uh, if you wanna know, uh, this example can be replicated in MA like this, I can do a similar thing. I can do a declare just, just like the index thing and I can return ampersand A and then you can ask, but what is ampersand? Well, one way to do it is to say, uh, I can make it a primitive notion if you look in PFPL, I do. But the other thing I can do is I can just say, no, ampersand A uh, for an assignable type tau just means a pair of a getter and a setter. It's a tau command and a tau error tau command. So this is the setter and that's the getter. And so then I can return it. So I already, so the point is references don't need to be thought of as you know addresses. The re references are the capability to get and set. And here it's quite explicit. So this is the notion of a capability. You, you might've heard of heard that word or not. It used to be very popular in connection with operating systems classes. I'm not sure if they still use that terminology uh, anymore, but it was popular at one point. Okay, so I, I wrote this down in order to tell you that, oops, that that example applies to MA. So as of this moment, that asterisk, this is that asterisk. So as, as of this moment, uh, something is gonna be a problem because this cannot make sense. Because if you look at the transition, what is this guy gonna do? It's gonna allocate an assignable, initialize it to E, in other words, create a server containing E, and then it's immediately going to return, well, maybe this pair of procedure, pair of commands, or it's going to return a pointer, however you'd like to say, uh, which to A, and well, that, that doesn't make any sense because if you think informally in terms of a stack, then you put A here, okay, here's my A, and then I immediately pop it while having ampersand A, no. Okay, that doesn't make sense. Okay, so this is one of the ways in which C for all its virtues on its own terms does not make sense, okay? Because it itself promises more than it can deliver. So the only people to blame for that are, 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 are Richie basically. So, so, okay, that's the way it is. So what can we do with this scenario? So here we are, we, we've invented this language and we wanna have stack allocation and we have the notion of declare. And if you ignore the yellow, this is the, the typing rule that I suggested for it before. It's a command returning a tau that uh, extends the state and initializes it, okay? And, uh, and I explained what the dynamics looks like in terms of processes. And I pointed out the shapes of the processes that arise, which look like stacks. Okay, so what do we do? Well, one thing you can do is, if I decide that this stack allocation is precious to me, that I absolutely must have this stack allocation and deallocation, then the only thing I can do is impose, change the statics. If I want the dynamics to be precisely what I said, then the only thing I can do to recover, to get myself into a sane state of affairs, is to change the statics, to restrict the declaration so that it's allowed to exit and it will not run into trouble. I wanna rule out this kind of example, okay? So how do I do that? Well, what I do is I demand that the type of the assign, oops, the type of the assignable itself and the type of the return value must both be mobile. Mobile means can escape, can escape the scope of a declaration. Now the question is what are the mobile types? Now, uh, so the natural thing to do, I kind of gave the game away here with that remark. A natural thing to do is what are the base cases? Well, you could say zero and one are mobile, that is unit and void. They definitely don't contain any ampersand A's, okay? That, because they don't contain anything at all, okay? It's just unit and, or, or void. And indeed, that's a thing you can do. And if you want to know about idealized algol, 
Randall takes advantage of this. All of his commands return unit. They're all unit, okay? He can't have get be a command because all commands return unit. So he's sort of wedged and the move I'm going to make is not available in ide idealized algorithm. That's the point I wanna make. Okay, but anyway, so here we go. And with one and zero can be considered mobile. And then you might think, oh yeah, numbers are mobile, right? Baloney, no, wrong, this is, no, 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 you've made a mistake, okay? Why? Because if your damn successor is lazy, you can embed within a number, you can have a suspended computation that involves ampersand A and then return seven. Shit. So not even the type of natural numbers is obviously mobile. Now you might say word is mobile. If we had a type of words and word means, you know, 64 bit thingy with modular arithmetic, okay, I, I grant you that word is mobile. And uh, we're good with that. Float would be mobile. And in Algol, you had int, float, integer, it was called, which stood for word actually, and float and double. Okay, that's it. So no problem with Algol. The C bug didn't arise because the language was rather diminished expressive power. So as long as your successor is eager, then that can be regarded as mobile. Or if you have words, floats, something like that, then that can be regarded as mobile. I'm simply saying you want to be careful about those. And then you can propagate mobility. So for example, the sum and product of two mobile types is mobile, but a no, no function type can be regarded as mobile because you might embed within the code some access to an assignable that you no longer have, okay? And that would be used here if I, if I played out in full what the capability, what exactly that ampersand A is, it would be some procedures. And so I can't allow error. So I have a mobility judgment. And then with the suitable mobility restrictions, uh, so that's on the return value. You might ask why does sigma itself have to be mobile? Well, you see, I can simulate a return value by having an agreed upon assignable in which I dump the return value when I return. So I'd better not be able to, all the things that are in assignables had better be mobile as well, because otherwise they could contain uh, references to an assignable that no longer exists. So I do this as an exercise because it shows you how to recover from the C bug because C as it's designed a priori commits to the idea of a runtime stack. Therefore, something has to give and what has to give is certain programs have to be ruled out. Now with C, it's a serious problem because you also have address arithmetic and stuff and ampersand A's are actually ints and you have casting. Okay, 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 I understand that. But I, 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 but I just wanted to make the point that let's say I'm doing MA, my formulation of MA as I gave in the first is wrong for the reason that's analogous to why, why C has that mistake. And here's one way to fix it. Now the question is, what is the other thing? What is the other way to fix it? It's item five that I missed from the structural congruence, a critical pi calculus rule called scope extrusion. So what I can do is, instead of changing the statics, I'm gonna let any declare whatsoever. You're allowed to return ampersand, I don't care. But I must give up on the idea of stack allocation. I can do that. I can give up on stack allocation. So if I don't insist on a stack, then I can return things out of their scope. How do I do that? Because the terminology return them out of their scope is misleading. Of course, I cannot return it out of its scope. That makes no sense. What I can do is enlarge its scope. Ah, so this is the idea. And in pi calculus literature, the equation I'm writing is called scope extrusion. I have a process which allocates an assignable. I have another process hanging around. I can extrude its scope which is written here, the scope can be enlarged to encompass that other process. And you can repeat this. So this has the effect of saying, all of the assignables are global in scope because if I apply this equation aggressively, I can prop push all of the new ways out to, the, out to the front. That means they're globally assigned. Ah, this is a nice idea. And now, so that corresponds to heap allocation because there's no longer this idea of one after another after another. They all just have global scope, but in compensation, how do I recover storage? Well, I can do the same thing. I can take the state, a state that looks like this, and I can say, 
erase it, make it structurally congruent to just run of red of V prime, which is the body here, provided A does not occur in V prime. Does that look familiar? That's called a tracing garbage collector. Because A being a free assignable in V prime is what you do when you do the tracing phase of garbage collection. You're checking, you're tracing down all the pointers as they're usually called. You're chasing down the assignables that people depend on. And you say, if, it, if V doesn't depend on it, then I can get rid of it. Okay, that's the, the idea. I'm a little worried about one other thing, which is the other assignable. Oh, they're all, well, mm, there might be a bug in this. There's a, I just thought of a, some issue that I have to, I'll, I'll get back to you online. But uh, at heart is the right idea. There's a little worry because what if there's another assignable? Uh, well, I shouldn't call it B prime then, but anyway, uh, I have to think about that. All right. The gist of it is still what I want to say, okay? Which is that, yeah, I have to do something a little, a little fancier, okay? Uh, uh, all, all right, uh, I'll, I'll, I, I know what to do. I'll, 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 I'll owe it to you. Okay, so slightly, a slightly fancier version of this gives you tracing garbage collection. And the benefit of doing this tracing garbage collection, all assignables are mobile, you can escape the scope and that's it. So it's pretty nice. So the thing I wanna get across with this is that I'm using the tools of process calculus, which is kind of core PL theory notion. Everyone should have some acquaintance with process calculus, I think. And I'm using that to, to model in a, I think a very nice way by equational reasoning, the seemingly dirty, awful compiler ideas about stack allocation, heap allocation, blah, blah, blah. I don't know, I don't have to drop down to this. Okay, it can be expressed at a semantic level. And so this is what I'm kind of illustrating here by using, using the process calculus. So it's just a, another thing to perhaps intrigue you. Uh, and indeed, a long time ago, Liza Morissette and I wrote a paper about how to model garbage collection properly uh, 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 using these kinds of tools, like a way to understand what garbage collection is all about. And yeah, and the part of the message of that paper, which I find cute, is that copying garbage collection, if you're familiar with it, is actually just doing an alpha conversion. If you know what, know what I mean by that. I'm renaming bound variables, bound assignable names. I'm renaming bound names. That's what's happening. So the copying is just choosing, choosing other names. Yeah, that's what's going on. Anyway, you can go back and look at that. Uh, I found that. Uh, okay, good. All right, so that's what I uh, hope to say today. I'm at 6.30, which is good. Uh, it's about, about the right amount of time. Uh, so I wanted to give you a flavor. Uh, next time, what I'm going to do, partly at request, people are asking about dynamic classification, which is to do with confidentiality and integrity in programs. And that has everything to do with exceptions. And that particular remark, I don't see widely propagated. So it'll be worth worthwhile, I think, for me to explain what I mean about that. And then I can talk about like uh, uh, concurrency in this setting. Very likely I don't have time for modules. I kind of knew this was going to happen. And um, either I add a lecture or something, I'm not sure what I'm going to do if there's enough time, I'll worry about that later. But in, in these four lectures, I think I'm not gonna be able to get there. But I, I think it's important to understand dynamic classification. I think that's the uh, underappreciated concept in programming languages. And I would like for you you guys all to appreciate that. So, so that's what I, um, what I, what I will do next time. Okay, so that finishes um, uh, my discussion of modernized algol, which can be, as I said, as I developed it, is an extension of the lax PCF in which the command, the computation level is generalized to the command level to account for both storage and control effects. Okay, so that's a sort of nice way to do it. And um, so that's a systematic building up. Now, I said to you a little while ago that modernized algol is a, an abstraction of, uh, 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 of Algol from 1960. And in fact, uh, the, that Algol remains popular in wide use. What would you, can anyone tell me what, what Algol is called these days? Given what I've shown you? Nope. I'll take a stab at it. There are some guesses in the chat. That what? There are some guests in the chat. Pascal, Scheme, SML. 
Yeah, no, no, none of those. They don't have the structure. Pascal sort of does, but it's not really around anymore. It's none other than Haskell. Haskell is a dialect of Algol. The idea of tau command is nothing other than IO of tau. It is the exact same thing. Those ideas of the so-called monadic separation, blah, 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 were present in Algol in 1960. It's just that Algol had a limited expression value level, had a very limited set of types. If you had recursive types in the manner that I mentioned, now you're a long way along because now you're able to do functional programming at the expression level, which you weren't really able to do in Algol, okay? But you then also have a command level for doing imperative programming. Haskell is a dialect of Algol. I think it's worth appreciating this point because as Reynolds understood and formulating idealized Algol, there are really good ideas there. And, and he, wanted to, he wanted to promote them. And in fact, he used it for his studies of war logic, which eventually led to the, his discovery of separation logic, which by now is a, you know, a, a widely used uh, idea in uh, verification of imperative programs. But the origin of it is coming from Algol. So I kind of wanted, that's the point I wanted to make is uh, the, that what, what I'm really doing is describing idealized Haskell. Yes, I'm ignoring a whole bunch of things. I mean, I'm, I'm not dealing with anything about, for example, type classes or modularity. I can talk about that. If I do have time to talk about modularity, I can explain some very important ideas there as well that uh, pertain to both ML and Haskell. Uh, I don't know if I have time to do it. So I'd like uh, you to contemplate that. What, what, did you say, oh, sorry, what did you say was uh, the construct in Algol that is mon that's monads in Haskell? Uh, you said some particular construct in Algol you said some. Uh, I didn't. I didn't quite hear the question. Uh, you you said there was a construct in Algol that is essentially the same as Monads in Haskell. Is that right? Uh, is it the same as IO in in Haskell? Um, so what was the construct in Algol? So tau. What I call tau command. Okay. Is just IO of tau. I see. That's what's going on. That that is. I did this deliberately. I I laid a trap for you in a certain sense. It's a pedagogical device. I wrote this all out explaining, explaining to you as if I have this obsession with an ancient language called Algol. But as a matter of fact, what I'm describing to you is the, the, the core structure of Haskell. I see, wonderful, thank you, thank you. So this was present in Algol in 1960, but that's my point. I see. And so, uh, but it has a much more enriched expression level because people appreciate the virtues of functional programming. But overall, you know, it's an imperative language, as is ML. You can do right. mutation. But there's no monadic separation in ML. That's the, you know, so uh, quite a long time ago, O'Hearn said this to me. Uh, he said, you know, there's really only two languages in the world, ML and Algol. And I said, what do you mean? And he explained to me, and I was like, you are right. So it's, uh, it's an idea that has stuck with me. So I thought I would... Uh, Thought I would mention that. So this idea of separating commands from expression, it's an oldie. And so uh, I, uh, I, I wanna bring that up. So that's a lot of credit to like the, the inventors of Algol. They, they really did a hell of a good job and they consciously used the Lambda calculus in 1960. The procedure call mechanism is called by name Lambda calculus. They hadn't yet invented lax modality. That was the problem. And therefore you're forced to use call by name. Because if you want to pass a command as an argument to a procedure, the way you do it is if you're using call by name, you just write the command down, but it doesn't get run because it's called by name and then it is magically inlined into your imperative code. That's how it works. Okay. It's like, in that regard, it's a little crazy, but it was well known. This idea of call by name comes from Algol. The terminology, I'm pretty sure it comes from Algol. And it was used for that reason. But in the light of the way we think about now, we can refine it. And that's what uh, MA is all about, or IA in Reynolds' is case. So, so, so that's, the, that's the critical thing. So the advantage, uh, in terms of my remarks about Reynolds, the advantage of MA is that the expression level remains mathematically pure. 
you have all the equations you always had, nothing is disrupted because, and, and including X plus X is equal to two times X, no matter what, because X is a variable, not an assignable. Reynolds, on the other hand, advocated that a, an assignable is a form of expression that implicitly gets its contents. But to me, this, that's the originally Bacchus's idea for Fortran. And to me, that's, uh, I, that's just uh, my, my opinion, I guess. I, I just think that that's a bad idea. Um, so that's one, one point I can think of where I have differed from Reynolds and never succeeded to understand why he's right, because probably he is. I just haven't understood it yet. <laughs> but as far as I understand it, that's, uh, that's, the, that's the deal. So he wanted to be able to write A plus A, raise an assignable, God damn it. That was of the utmost importance to him. So FYI. So, uh, okay, so that's it for me for today. I'm gonna go for a bike ride. Evan Bergeron, you're lit up, but is that accidental or are you asking a question or? I'm not hearing you. Okay, I don't know about anybody else, but I'm not. I'm, uh, not, I don't, hearing. I'm, I'm not hearing yeah. me either. Uh, Evan Bergeron, we can't hear you. I don't know if you can hear us, but we the can't hear you. The question in chat is: Is standard out and assignable? Uh, okay, we can't we can't hear him. Oh, is standard out? Yes. I mean, it's a buffer, right? That's what you're doing. You're writing to the buffer. You're concatenating onto a string and writing to the buffer. Do that's what I would know? do. Yeah. Okay, so, so that's, I... that's on the chat. Thanks. There okay, was a question from earlier, no, a bug report. No. Oh, maybe go ahead. I made a mistake about garbage collection. My mistake is this. The garbage collection step also has to trace other, other servers that might involve A. So you have to collect up all of them, find them all. Okay, that, that's what you need to be able to do. So anyway, I forgot to do that. I, I made a mistake there, but the, the concept is the same. The free, the free in condition is tracing. Okay. The other bug so was if you go back to get and set, you flipped the question mark and bang. Did I wear? Okay, if you go to to the rules where you define them, then you go to the next. Did I, did I screw it up here somewhere? Yeah. So the first rule says a question mark is uh, the right operation, and then the next slide, I I believe you you switch them. I think I use, I think I'm self consistent on this screen. Am I right? On this one, yes. But on the next screen, I guess you use the exclamation mark as the right operation instead of the question. If if I saw it correctly. I... <laughs> okay, let's uh, deal with that in Slack to make sure I get it right. Uh, I'm not quite understanding in real time, but I'm sure you have a point. So, okay. Uh, Thanks. Yeah, well, let's talk about it on Slack so that I don't miss it. Right. Already? There's another All question right, from the chat. Much. Someone's yeah. requesting, maybe it's better for Slack, but someone's requesting materials on face distinction in modules. About the face, say again, please. Someone's requesting materials on the face distinction and modules. Maybe that's better. Yeah, what about it? Someone's requesting related materials since you're not going to cover it. Oh, on the face distinction. Well, it's on my web page. Because the way I think about it now is, oh, is something that John Sterling and I invented last summer. So uh, it's a, that would be the reference there. If I have the opportunity, I'll speak about that because I think it's a wicked cool idea. But I realized I couldn't start with that. I was going to start my lectures with that. But I then thought, oh, this is hopeless. I, I can't do this. So therefore, I opted for the order I'm developing because you have to yeah, unfortunately, I, I have to yeah, I, I have to get a bunch of ideas on the table in the way that I like to think about them in order to explain the bigger ideas. So I had I, I, I think this is of use to you and I did the right thing, but it was difficult for me to uh, say everything in four days. So uh, as I say, I'm hoping to whet your appetite and, and 